Dee Dee Garcia Blaze. All right. I'm short. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Dee Dee Garcia Blaze, the co founder of now Somos Independence. And um, I wanted to organize the fastest growing voting block, independence. And, um, you know, like he said, I'm a former Republican, long life Republican for 20 years. Um, part of that decision of my being a Republican um, stemmed from my military service. I am a Gulf War I vet and I honorably served. I was a bomb dog handler, um, so I'm somewhat of an adrenaline junkie and I like to um, con confront things. And uh, one of the things that I did confront uh, helped, uh, one of the things that I did was help to oust Senator Russell Pierce. Um, back when um, he was making this push for these anti-immigrant laws here in our state, I worked with a libertarian candidate who was running against Russell Pierce. Her name was Andrea Garcia. I don't know if some of you know her, um, but um, I supported Andrea um, because she was libertarian. She wasn't Republican. She wasn't Democrat. Uh, keep in mind, at the time, I was a Republican still, and I didn't want to support a Democratic candidate. And I felt comfortable with Andrea's story, and I was out there in Mesa in um, Senator Russell Pierce's backyard collecting signatures. Now, I was the very first recall effort. After I initiated my recall effort, there was a second group who did a second recall effort. So we were out there. There were two uh, groups collecting signatures to help recall Senator Russell Pierce. So we got together and um, we met. I met with the other leader, uh, Mr. Peraz. He's a lawyer here. And we sort of just asked each other, you know, one of us should probably disband and, and join forces with the other. So I said, well, how many signatures do you have? He had a little bit more probably about a couple hundred, maybe 500 more signatures than I did. And so I went ahead and bowed out and supported the continued recall effort. And obviously, Senator Russell Pierce is ousted. Um, I also, with you know, being a Republican, I worked with Mormon leaders in Mesa. I knew that in order to replace a Mormon lawmaker in Mesa, there needed to be another Mormon to replace him with, a Republican. So I supported the um, moderate, more moderate um, Republican in that district. And I worked with Mormon elders. I'm not a Mormon, but you know I know how it works. And I worked with one of the uh, top elders, top Mormon elders in the state of Arizona. And um, what we did is we did these um, firesides. Now, a, a Mormon fireside is equivalent to a uh, tent revival. Like if you're a Baptist or one of those Southern evangelicals, they have these tent revivals and they, they preach the word of God. Well, Mormons conduct firesides. And so I worked with Mormon elders and leaders to um, persuade Mormons why Russell Pierce really is kind of a bad image for the Mormon religion, you know? And, and I, I called out that hypocrisy, considering um, how many Mormons go out and send their missionaries to Mexico, all of the Latin countries. And so I called out the hypocrisy of that. And um, I, I penned a letter to the prophet of Mormonism. I got, I got called an extremist for doing that, for simply writing an opinion, um, you know, calling out the Mormon prophet, and you know what I mean? And um, I was called an extremist, and I, I quoted uh, Barry Goldwater. That's how I handled it. You know, sometimes you do need to be extreme, you know? 
especially when it comes to hypocrisy. So um, just a little bit of background on my um, activism. Like he said, I'm a former Republican, now I'm an independent. I wanted to get out in front of the fastest growing voting bloc. Um, I have a history of helping push for comprehensive immigration reform since George W. Bush. Um, I've helped Senator McCain uh, before he passed away. Um, he was one of the leaders who spearheaded the Gang of Eight um, back in 2016. It did pass the U.S. Senate. It did not pass the House, obviously, because of the Tea Party people, um, the restrictionists, the uh, isolationists who um, fear too many brown people coming into the country. Um, I've, I've taken trips, several trips, to Washington, D.C. Um, I've worked with the Jewish community. Uh, you name it. I've, I've been involved for almost two decades. So I've got a lot of uh, work. I've done a lot of free advocacy, helping families to this day. I'm still helping families. I'm, I'm helping this one woman where her husband is deported. She is a mother of two. Um, and she wants her family to be together again. And so we're going through the process, you know, with immigration lawyers and things of that nature. And her husband has no criminal record. None. And, it, you know, she's been working for the past three years to try to unify her family. And this is kind of where I step in and, and call out the hypocrisy of Republicans who claim to be for keeping families together and moms and dads should be together but be that as it may they might they may believe that but it doesn't apply to immigrants and so i'm very quick to call out republican talking points you know you should you know follow through if you really believe in keeping families together and again the woman that i'm helping the mother of two children um, her husband who's deported has no criminal background in fact when he was here, he was an entrepreneur. What he did was um, he charged car batteries. He had a mobile service. And so if somebody uh, needed a recharged car battery, they'd call him and he'd zip out and, and sell him the battery. You know, he, he didn't usurp any of the benefits, you know, that a lot of people use. Food stamps health care, you name it. They don't do that. Um, one of the other um, hypocritical things that I like to point out is, um, and I don't know if you guys were here for Maj's presentation last night, but he brought up genocide. You know, I don't, do you guys recall that? And um, a lot of people, what they don't understand is Mexicans, and I'm Mexican-American, Mexicans are natives to the entire Southwest. We're not even an immigrant. We were here before people landed on Plymouth Rock. And so that's why I took issue with Russell Pierce, the ousted Russell Pierce, because he wanted to bring back, quote, Operation Wetback. Now, wetback, that term is a derogatory term to us. It just is. It's antiquated. There's no need to use that word wetback. We didn't come here on boats. We were already here. So there's a lot of misconception out there where these now nativists that don't support comprehensive immigration, legal immigration reform, they just don't have a clue as to how they came here and who was already here. So um, I kind of just wanted to um, point that out, how that is offensive to people like me, you know, where my family have, my family, I have a family history where they were here long before other immigrants from Europe. So um, I hope you guys kind of uh, get a gist of how we feel as brown people, as Mexicans, 
Um, and um, but we know how there are some the and you know the restrictionists who like to um, incorrectly say things with with regard to who immigrants are, who the quote unquote wetbacks are. Um, One of the reasons why I'm an independent registered voter is um, seeing the hypocrisy on both sides. And um, one of the libertarian people, politicians that I look up to is Gary Johnson, the former New Mexican governor. And um, he has a pretty strong idea of what it's like to govern a, govern a state that borders Mexico. He gets it. Um, I agree with a lot of his uh, philosophies with regard to um, being socially liberal, but being economically um, and phys uh, fiscally conservative with uh, taxes and spending. And um, it's people like Gary Johnson that will catch my attention and people in my community He's, he's going to get our attention, and we're going to gravitate towards his thought process. Um, with the show of hands, how many of you are baby boomers? <laughs> okay. How many of you are approaching the age of 65 or older? a time when many U.S. citizens can begin receiving benefits, Social Security. Okay, so my, my case for legal immigration reform is going to come from that standpoint. I'm going to show you why legal immigration reform is important, and I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of boring stuff, so bear with me. I don't, I don't like to just talk out of my ass here. I like to refer to reports, federal reports, uh, by the CBO and the government. Whatever they are, are supposed to do, they're supposed to have a report every year with regard to benefits, what's, what's you know, costing us, where our taxes are going. Um, Dan Kaplinger has been a writer for The Motley Fool, an investment website since 2006. He has a background as an estate planning attorney and independent financial consultant, and his articles are based on more than 20 years of experience from all angles of the financial world. Mr. Kaplinger came out with an article he wrote based on the 2018 Social Security Trustees Report pointing out some things that you should probably know. Social Security is expected to run out of money in 15 years or 2034. I don't know if you guys know that. But a lot of Americans do not know that. Um, so those of you who are baby boomers or, up, or are approaching retirement age should pay attention to how legal immigration reform will benefit you. According to the Board of Trustees of the Federal Old Age Survivors Disability Insurance, OASDI trust funds, under the intermediate assumptions, the Disability Insurance Trust Fund, or the DI, asset reserves are projected to become depleted in 2028, at which time continuing, continuing income to the DI Trust Fund would be sufficient to pay 93% of DI scheduled benefits or disability. Therefore, legislation, legislative action is needed to address the DI disability program uh, the financial imbalance. The old age survivor's insurance trust fund reserves are projected to become depleted in 2035, at which time the OAS OASI income would be sufficient to pay only 75% of the OASI or the Social Security benefits. So, in other words, I am trying to appeal to the baby boomers, to those who are at retirement age, why they should support legal immigration reform, fixing the broken immigration system, because immigrants are living in the shadows of society. 
Do they pay taxes? Absolutely they do. They pay gas taxes, grocery taxes, all these other taxes, but what they need to be paying more of are these social security taxes. I know many of you are not for taxes, but let's face it, we're all paying them. It is a burden that we all share to pay those taxes, and those living in the shadows of society should also be bearing that burden as well until things get overhauled. I mean, fair is fair. Okay, so what is going to help the continuance of Social Security benefits of the United States if the United States is not at an even replacement rate? I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the United States population replacement rate, but we are not replacing ourselves. It should be two people, you know, from a creationist point of view, two people replacing two other people here in the United States. And right now, we're not at that replacement rate. According to this same 2018 Social Security report I've been telling you about, um, and they, this report was given to the Trump administration and Speaker Ryan last year, after 1936, the total fertility rate rose to I'm um, just to kind of give you a little bit of history. After 1936, the total fertility rate rose to 3.68 in 1957 and then fell to 1.74 by 1976. After 1976, the total fertility rate rose above 2.0 by 1990, where it generally remained through 2009, but now the fertility rate has dropped below 1.9 zero for 2011 through now. So we're not at a replacement rate. In other words, we are not at a replacement rate that will continue to allow the continuance of Social Security benefits being offered to United States citizens. To make it economically worse, we see a strong trend with the aging population living longer. Period. Back, back in the 50s, people weren't living as old as they are now. And part of the reason um, is we have better health services offered. Um, where am I at? Oh, yeah. We know that mortality rates in the U.S. is declining because according to the National Center for Health Statistics, death rates have declined substantially in the U.S. since 1900, with rapid declines over some periods and slow or no improvement over the other periods. Many factors are responsible for historical reductions um, in death rates, including medical advances, uh, increased availability of health care services, and improvements in sanitation and nutrition. Historical death rates generally decline more slowly for older ages and more rapidly for children and infants than for the rest of the population. So I wanted to cite um, the National Center for Health Statistics to essentially um, prove that those in the aging population are living longer. So, I mean, we're looking at a train wreck. You've got the aging population who benefits from social security, but they're living longer, so that's why there is a concern um, with regard to money running out. What will aid the continuance of U.S. citizens receiving Social Security benefits? If we have the aging population living longer, thus costing me, the younger generation, um, or us that are younger, um, we should, from a moral standpoint, I do believe in taking care of our elderly. Um, I heard Mark Victor yesterday um, pointing out the distinct difference between a moral obligation and a legal obligation. And I do support moral obligations to take care of our elderly. And that's kind of where I'm coming from here as well. Um, but if we have the aging population living longer, and when the United States is not even at a replacement rate, an even replacement rate, what do we do? What's the answer? And Gary Johnson nailed it 
several times in a lot of his immigration interviews, uh, we create, we, we add more taxpayers to contribute to this burden that we all bear in paying taxes. And, and there are approximately 11 to 12 million undocumented immigrants out there living in the shadows of society, and they should uh, contribute to those Social Security taxes. Um, established in 1979, the National Immigration Law Center, basically it's an organization with a bunch of lawyers who support constitutional rights as well as immigration rights, is one of the leading organizations in the U.S. Ex exclusively dedicated to defending and ad advancing the rights of immigrants and they engage in lawsuits that defend the fundamental and constitutional rights of all Americans. Um, the NILC highlighted in its January 2015 report how changes in immigration policy might affect the federal budget. Nonpartisan Congre uh, Congressional Budget Office, or the CBO. Um, the CBO confirms that a fair and inclusive immigration policy would have a net positive impact on the federal budget. So we have the CBO saying, make these guys share in the tax burden, and it will have a net positive impact on our economy. But yet, we have right-wingers who don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear how brown people, immigrants, by and large, can help them. And there's a reason for that. There are, uh, John Tanton is uh, the crusader. He, he's a crusader who has formed many organizations uh, that support anti-immigrant views, isolationist views, restrictionist views. Um, he also supports setting up abortion clinics all over the world. And yet you have Republicans hypocritical ones who really don't understand where a lot of this anti-immigrant rhetoric is coming from, they don't understand that they're supporting a person who is responsible for setting up abortion clinics all over the world. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is, is because one of the reasons why I left the Republican Party is because of their hypocrisy on pro-life. And Yet, I see Republicans supporting people like John Tanton, an anti-immigrant cru crusader. So that is another reason why I left the party, and I think that there's hypocrisy on both sides. Um, and it, it kind of uh, sort of points out my concern with regard to the replacement rate not being met here in the United States. Personally, I think a lot of that has to do with women who are using abortions or carrying out abortions as a method of birth control. So that might be why we're not replacing ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not judging anybody <laughs> when it comes to that policy on abortion, but I just want to, you know, point out that hypocrisy. Now, um, granting lawful immigration status to currently unauthorized workers would increase federal coffers that currently support citizens that are currently utilizing Social Security benefits. And the CBO cites uh, estimates indicating that over 50% of unauthorized workers pay income taxes and Social Security and Medicare taxes, aka the payroll taxes, through their employers even though they are not eligible for benefits under these programs. This figure would only increase if more workers were given lawful status. So in other words, a lot of the undocumented here do use other people's social security cards. Whether it's their own family, their relatives, or whatever, there is identi ident identity theft. And if um, we support comprehensive immigration uh, reform, there, there will be a reduction in identi identity theft. Personally, um, <laughs> I wouldn't mind somebody using my Social Security card uh, because it'll benefit me. 
but it's not the right thing. I haven't done it, but you get the idea that it is being done. They are still contributing to Social Security um, using other people's Social Security numbers. Taxes and spending, a lot of people, and I, I've even heard this from some libertarian people, that they just think that immigrants are just not going to benefit the economy. The economy. Um, the contributions immigrants make as both taxpayers and consumers are indispensable to the U.S. economy. Nationally, immigrants earned $1.3 trillion in 2014, and they contributed $105 billion in state and local taxes and almost $224 billion in federal taxes. This left them with nearly $927 billion in spending power, which they frequently use to purchase goods and services, stimulate local business activity, and create jobs in the broader U.S. economy. The Immigration Forum states, immigrants paid in 2014 an estimated $223.6 billion in federal taxes. This includes $123.7 billion in Social Security. B, with the B, $123.7 billion in Social Security. And, and we're talking about how people haven't even fully come out of the shadows of society. Imagine if we uh, give them that opportunity and how it'll benefit us all, and perhaps I might benefit from getting back what I've put into the Social Security coffer system. Um, the combined contribution of immigrants in 2014 was $328.2 billion in taxes. In California, immigrants pay 28% of the total taxes in the state. Now, according to the census, the Hispanic population of the United States as of July 1, 2015, making people of Hispanic origin the nation's largest ethnic or racial minority. Hispanics make up of approximately 17.6% of the nation's total population. Um, I think that might be a little bit more because there are um, census people who knock on doors um, and immigrants are afraid to answer the door these days with no help of Senator Russell Pierce and these ICE raids and these immigration scares. So that's why I think there's a little bit more than 17.6% of you know, us being part of the entire Hispanic population. Um, another report I kind of want to highlight, um, it's a new report put out last year, puts a price tag on the Latino population in the United States, and it is over $2 trillion. This economic power says the report would rank as the seventh largest in the world if the Latino GDP, gross domestic product, were its own country. Seventh. But yet you don't hear those far right-wingers and Trump people uh, stating positive facts. What, what, what they are, uh, the talking points that they are using are the talking points from um, John Tanton, this anti-immigrant, pro-abortion crusader. But the facts are the facts. And that's why I'm reading some of these uh, reports to you so that you know that I'm just not saying these things. And um, I'm giving you facts here. Headed by University of California, Los Angeles professor David E. Hayes, Bautista and Werner Schink, CEO of Latino Futures Research. The report commissioned by the nonpartisan group Latino Donor Collaborative estimates the total GDP of the Latino population based on data that is publicly available at the U.S. Department of Commerce and the U.S. Department of Labor. In a discussion with NBC News over the phone, Hayes Bautista said that most studies on Latino economic power look at Hispanics one-dimensionally through their spending power. But by looking at Latinos beyond consumption and instead through their economic production, Latinos' contribution to the nation can be seen more as an investment than as an expense. Um, 
Bautista says, I've been studying Latinos for over 40 years, and you can point out some amazing things about Latinos, but people just yawn. That's true. But if you reframe Latinos in terms uh, investors can understand by size and growth rate, we can have a better idea of Latinos' importance to the, U the U.S. Econi economy. Um, he is a professor, Bautista is a professor of medicine and the director of the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture at the School of Medicine at UCLA. Um, according to this report by this professor in UCLA, the U.S. Latino GDP is growing 70% faster than the country's non-Latino GDP. So there's uh, finally a positive spin there. Um, ordinarily, we just, uh, and I say we because they look like me. I'm not an immigrant. Um, but ordinarily, you know, people just want to state falsehoods such as uh, they use all the benefits and they're not even taxpayers and, you know, they're drug dealers, they're murderers, and all of that BS, and it is BS. Um, I am totally for uh, throwing out the real crim criminal element of the undocumented. I'm all about that. And many of uh, Hispanics and Latino immigrants are because, by and large, they are Catholic. The majority of them are Catholic, um, unlike uh, some people who would like to equate them to Muslims and terrorists. And there, there's a reason why I'm pointing out the fact that a lot of them are Catholic is, is because they're referred to as Muslim terrorists. That's not true. Um, I passed out this handout to you because um, as a leader in advocating for comprehensive legal immigration reform, um, I didn't want to be like some people where they just pull the victim card. I, I don't do that at all. Um, I don't believe we should just whine and cry about things. I think we should try to propose a solution. And um, this document that I point, uh, passed out it, uh, consists of 12 steps to securing our borders and legal immigration. Um, and I put it together along with another lawyer here, um, Joe Peñalosa, and also Lionel Sosa, who used to be the Ronald Reagan Hispanic advisor way back in the day. He's still alive. Um, but I received his blessing on these 12 steps. Um, so just briefly, the 12 steps include border security. Um, I do believe that the preservation of our national security must be paramount, the paramount objective of immigration policy of the United States. Um, in addition, though, in addition to Border Patrol ensuring protection of our borders in the south, there ought to also be Border Patrol at the northern border. I mean, have you guys noticed that? I mean, and the northern border is extremely porous. So if I really wanted to hurt this country, I'm going to come through Canada. So in addition, the Department of Homeland Security should work in conjunction with the Drug Enfor Enforcement Agency to take appropriate measures, including the addition of drug and bomb-sniffing canine units that will deter drug activities. I had to throw in that bomb dog spin because I used to be a bomb dog and a drug dog handler. And, you know, everybody, you know, right now is worried about drugs coming into the nation through Mexico. And I'll tell you what, dogs can sniff one gram of hashish, marijuana, heroin, you name it. They can, they can sniff that out uh, several hundred yards away. And I think they're superior, they have superior noses that can help um, address the concerns of too many drugs being imported into the United States. Um, number two, processing application fees. The creation of a path to citizen for undocumented persons should not increase the bureaucracy in Washington or add to the already heavy burdens on the American taxpayer. 
all applications for legal status by undocumented immigrants should be processed as effectively and efficiently as possible and all expenses in connection with processing them via these applications including background checks should be borne by the applicant in the amount of 500 bucks so it shouldn't cost more than 500 bucks to do a background check and and do that start that application fee that is just the paperwork fee I think they should pay and they will they wouldn't have any problem with paying 500 bucks um, number three the uh, a fine a fine should be imposed for breaking civil law because when they come here illegally they are committing a civil offense so there's no right that we Americans hold more dearly than the privilege of calling ourselves citizens of the United States we do not advocate amnesty therefore undocumented individuals should be required to pay fine as a civil penalty not to exceed 1500 bucks per person or 5000 per family for entering the country illegally and after a background check clearance has been carried out so can you imagine all of like imagine 11 to 12 million undocumented paying 1500 to 5000 to the government it will ease the burden off of us paying for themselves for registration upon enactment undocumented persons must register with the DHS for background check and wait until the border is certified as secure by the Department of Homeland Security in order to trigger legalization persons should be given the opportunity to remain in the US as residents with a temporary temporary legal status five the regular regularization process upon certification undocumented immigrants who satisfy the requirements for temporary legal status with moral character and no criminal record will enter into a six-year program before becoming US citizens so with these 11 and 12 million that want to eventually become US citizens um, they can't for six years they have to prove themselves um, no participants in the program shall be entitled to receive any federal government assistance while this program is put into place the six-year wait proving themselves six paying back taxes undocumented immigrants must apply for Social Security number from the IRS and pay any income taxes owed so if they had been living in the shadows of society not paying Social Security taxes this is kind of like where I'm saying hey you need to do the right thing and pay back taxes because the rest of us are seven assimilation and mandatory English education I had to throw this in there because there's a lot of people who are afraid that we're gonna be Mexico um, you know that that's never gonna be the case but um, undocumented immigrants who are qualified to enter the regular regularization process shall be required to take courses in English and civics as a condition to obtain a certificate of completion for you as citizenship the hours of study should be twice the amount to what the Reagan administration had proposed as part of the immigration legislation championed by the president in the 1980s so I doubled it just to shut some people up and immigrants will do it that's how hungry they are that's how much they believe in becoming an American citizen nine or eight the US labor market ag jobs dream act the individuals who satisfy all of the requirements of the regularization process shall become permanent legal residents of the United States depending upon the labor demands the DHS can begin the green card process if employment levels are five percent or below if the national unemployment levels are greater than six percent the DHS will only process those undocumented immigrants working in unskilled industries where the demand for their labor remains very high such as the case in the agricultural industry hospitality sec sectors and by the way we're going to need more of those hospitality sectors because of the aging population 
Who's going to take care of you? I mean, Latinos and Chicanos, Hispanics, we tend to take care of our own mom and dad. By and large, we don't stick our parents in elderly care centers. We're, we're caring people. So, you, you know, these far right-wingers need to understand that, you know, we're probably going to take care of you. Be nice, damn it. <laughs> um, highly skilled workers in competitive industries where demand cannot be satis satisfied by the existing population of legal residents of the United States. Um, I've already told you that we're not at a replacement rate right now. Um, and four, years of service in the United States Armed Forces. So in other words, I think that if you are an immigrant and you're willing to die for this country, you should be a U.S. citizen, period. In fact, I advocated for a man by the name of Hector Barajas. He served several years under honorable conditions as uh, Airborne Army. And yet he got deported because he was at the wrong place at the wrong time in California. But it doesn't negate the service that he completed for this country. If you're an immigrant and you serve this nation honorably, you should become a citizen. Not just freaking recruit immigrants from all over the world and then... Um, they serve honorably and then you throw them under the bus and deport them. Yeah, I don't believe in that at all. So, but anyway, Hector Barajas is back. Um, he uh, got a pardon from the California governor and um, he's out there speaking and advocating for other veterans who are deported um, because he believes in not leaving no man behind. And um, if you're in the military and if you've been in the military, you'll understand that. Um, philosophy. Guest worker program. The adoption of a guest worker program would permit individuals registering with DHS to legally enter into the U.S. to work in states uh, whose governors or other legally authorized persons certify that demand for labor cannot be satisfied by existing populations of legal residents will strengthen the economy. The number of workers admitted to such a program would depend on the demand levels identified by the states and can suspend the program in the event that the national unemployment rate exceeds certain levels. So this kind of addresses people who are afraid of jobs being taken by immigrants. You know, we're um, tasking state governors to, to keep an eye on their needs. And, and to tell the federal government where needs need to be filled. H-1 visa. At a bare minimum, the number of H-1 visas issued in any given year should be increased from their insufficient current maximum 85,000 to at least 200,000. Now, let me explain what an H-1 visa is. These are highly trained, highly skilled technical people who have graduate degrees. Why wouldn't we want to receive talent? And I'm, I'm going to kind of expand a little bit on that. You know, uh, one of my business partners is from Iraq. And PhD, two other degrees, business owner, uh, you know, very successful individual. And I, I'll never forget the story that he told me. He said, you know, um, all Americans need to understand and realize is that when immigrants such as himself from Baghdad, Iraq, come to the United States and they experience our freedoms, they go and tell their families and relatives from whatever country that they come from. <clears throat> and then those relatives and family and friends in those countries want what we have. So essentially it promotes freedom it promotes the people in other countries want what we have just because you know their sons and daughters are over here telling them about the freedoms that they enjoy here 
and a lot of people uh, don't give enough credit to that regard. Eleven, almost done. Um, <clears throat> targeting, circumventing criminals. Uh, although cooperation between state and federal law enforcement officers is essential to the protection of our borders, Section 287G of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996 has not provided a proper framework for the establishment of cooperation between state and federal law enforcement officers. This despite the fact that the cost of the administration of the 287G program skyrocketed from $5 million in 2006 to $55 million in 2010. Um, that's a significant amount of pork spending. According to a report by DHS, the 287G enactment did not require sufficient focus on the identification and deportation of that small percentage of undocumented immigrants guilty of violent criminal offenses. So, um, in other words, I think we should uh, work smarter at identifying the real criminal element and not be out there at hotels, car washes, at the farms, doing these ICE raids with regard to targeting hard working immigrants. They need to spend more attention at targeting the real violent criminal element so that we can kick them out. And I do advocate for that. <coughs> Twelve, the last one, step 12 of the 12 steps to securing our border and making the case for legal immigration reform. The United States should continue honoring trade agreements such as NAFTA so that we do not undermine the stability of the economies and our relationships with our borders, I mean with our neighbors. Um, I just believe, you know, if you're really about national security, you're going to want to have good relationships with Mexico and Canada. And let me rewind to American history where uh, Hitler sent out that infamous telegram to Mexico wanting to attack the United States through Mexico. But Mexico did the right thing. They, they gave a copy of that telegram to the United States and essentially the Hitler regime, the regime were outed out. So you want to talk about national security? Be smart with our neighbors. Protect our front yard and our backyard. And a lot of these far right wingers don't get it because they're so focused on the color. They don't want too much of a browning of this nation, in my view. Particularly when they use uh, terms such as wetbacks and you know refer to immigrants as cockroaches and rats and essentially, you know, utilizing these dehumanizing terms. And um, with that, that completes, uh, you know, what I had to offer to my lawmakers, not just uh, whining and complaining, but offering a solution. You have a copy of the solution. If you didn't get a copy of the proposed solution that I believe is reasonable, um, uh, hit me up after and I'm going to conclude with a YouTube video by Gary Johnson and by the way Gary Johnson rocks on immigration views so let me just push play thank you yeah presumptive Republican nominee has said that he wants to build a big huge very expensive wall on our border with Mexico he also wants to uh, deport 11 million undocumented residents. Do you agree with this plan? And if not, what do you plan to do to defuse this very emotional situation? Well, I, I find both of his statements just incendiary, and I am speaking as a border state governor. Uh, the deportion, deportation of 11 million illegal immigrants is really based in misinformation, uh, building a fence across the border, uh, borders on insanity. Um, 
Uh, we should make it as easy as possible for somebody that wants to come into this country and work to be able to get a work visa. I'm not talking about a green card. I'm not talking about a citizenship, but a work visa that should entail a background check and a social security card so that applicable taxes get paid. They are not taking jobs that U.S. citizens want. They're hard-working individuals. The reason for the 11 million illegal immigrants is because there are jobs that exist in this country and they can't get across the border legally, so they cross illegally. And that's not the limit of the uh, really unreasonable foreign policy proposals uh, by the presumptive Republican nominee. The notion of uh, uh, having uh, Japan and uh, South Korea have access to nuclear weapons is crazy in a world where nuclear proliferation is the number one threat to the security of the world. The notion that he's going to impose huge penalties on Mexico and China at will uh, violates our obligations under treaties and international agreements like the World Trade Organization. You cannot be president of the United States and talk like that. You cannot even be a candidate for president of the United States and talk like that. And let me for a second, uh, how's the deportation of 11 million illegal immigrants going to work in my home state, New Mexico? where the population is 48% Hispanic. Is this going to be a knock on, the, well, it's going to amount to a knock on the door by the federal government. They come to my door, oh, gee, uh, you're the former governor. Um, um, I guess we won't search your house. But the next door they go to is statistically going to be Hispanic, and they're going to have to be papers produced. And I'm just telling you, this is incendiary.